Yeah, so, um, so I'm going to uh, ruminate a little about bad metals. Um, I realized, uh, I think that I'm the oldest person here, which is an uncomfortable position. Um, and so as the oldest person here, I feel I have a right to pontificate. Um, one of the things with this that's particularly uh, relevant to the, to the topic that I'm talking about is that it's not clear what the question is. Um, so when, when I was a graduate student, uh, first place, the field was called solid state physics, not condensed matter physics. And uh, it was very clear what the goal of solid state physics was. It was to produce numbers. It was very much in keeping with the naive statement of the scientific method that we were going to calculate the the bulk modulus of transition metals, or uh, maybe if we were very ambitious, transition temperatures, and you know whoever could calculate something with more numerical accuracy uh, was doing better job of science. Uh, it was also true that um, solid state physics was not represented in most of the best physics departments in the world. It was considered more part of chemistry or engineering. Uh, Murray Gulman uh, famously referred to it as squalid state physics and to Phil Anderson as the guy from the phone company. Um, uh, then with, um, with renormalization group and phase transitions, the idea that we were after something more conceptual, but again with a clear notion that what one was after was calculating something that even though it, it doesn't come from the microscopics in some sense, it was asymptotically exact. Again, you could quantitatively tell whether you were doing well or badly by how accurately you calculated a critical exponent. So there was a, a clear quantitative goal, you knew when you'd gotten a right answer. Um, uh, hydrodynamics is actually like that too. I mean, in the limit in which the length scales are arbitrarily large, the hydrodynamic equations are really asymptotically exact. And so, you know, it's just a question of working hard, but there's not a lot of fancy talking that you have to do. Um, in in most of what we've been studying since then, though, under this fancy new title of condensed matter physics, it's, it's not exactly clear what you're after. You, you've sort of given up the idea of either being able to or wanting to have quantitative understandings. You somehow, you, uh, well, I, uh, I tried to explain what I do to my daughter, who's somewhat of a philosopher, and she would have nothing of this. So we argued for about a year, and uh, we eventually published our view of, of what it is we're trying to do here in a paper that I need to boast about, because it was written with my daughter. Um, and uh, you know, so somehow what we're trying to do is to um, provide a, a simple and clear understanding of the essential phenomena, but the trick is it's not exactly obvious what an understanding means, and it's, of course, not obvious what essential means. So all of this is going to lurk in the background. I'm partly going to poke around to try to figure out what is the question about bad metals. Uh, there's one other thing that I, I want to say before I get started. Um, you know, my uh, colleague Su Cheng Zhang uh, took his life at the beginning of December, and many people have asked me questions about what this meant and why he did this, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, I think, something we'll never know the answer to. Um, uh, I think we should all 
remember. Uh, of course, we're after truth, and we have to be rather uh, uh, relentless in questioning everything in order to get at the truth. But we also have to remember to enjoy ourselves and to maybe be a little gentle with each other. All right, so now I'll get to, uh, to, um, I'll get to the topic of this talk. So, um, so uh, metals we learn about when we first study solid state physics. And the theory of metals is so simple that we sometimes lose track of the fact that this is really the most exotic state of matter that anybody's ever talked about. Um, and the Landau Fermi liquid theory certainly ranks as one of the great accomplishments of theoretical physics. I, I liked a line from Sentil, who was giving a talk to the string theorists at Princeton, and who pointed out that Fermi liquid theory was a piece of 21st century physics that was somehow discovered in the 20th century. Um, you know, uh, the Fermi liquid, for some reason, is extremely robust, and yet it has this vast number of low energy degrees of freedom. Uh, uh, it only has this marginal instability to BCS theory, and so it actually has lurking in it the understanding of the superconducting state as well. Uh, it has this amazing feature of dissipation in the limit as the temperature tends to zero. It has the largest entanglement of any state of matter. Uh, and it has emergent quantum effects on all length scales. For instance, in a clean Fermi liquid, the magnetization is famously a scaling function of B over T. And this, of course, leads to these spectacular phenomena of quantum oscillations, something that you could never have guessed on the basis of dimensional analysis. And you can even visualize these Fermi surfaces. All of these things, which are mathematically so trivial, are really incredible when you think of it. This is an essential singularity in the magnetic field dependence of the magnetization, and it's really observed in the laboratory. Um, good. So, um, so um, that's spectacular. Let's just back off and let's think about this, this quantity, the resistivity, which plays a key role in everything that, uh, that I'm going to talk about. And let's ask the question, suppose we didn't know anything about solids. Somebody told us that the properties of metals have to do with the quantum behavior of electrons. And then we would be able to guess what the resistivity is by dimensional analysis. So what would we do? We would just take fundamental constants of nature, which assuming that relativity is unimportant means we would take Planck's constant and the charge of the electron and the mass of the electron. And we would construct an object with the units of resistivity. And up to numerical factors, this is the only thing that we could possibly construct by dimensional analysis. And in three dimensions, this gives us 136.6 microohm centimeters. Uh, we're all familiar with this quantum of resistance in two dimensions, where it's just h over e squared, and where this naive dimensional analysis gives us something that we know is very important. This three-dimensional thing is the extension of this to higher dimension. Yes? So basically, why couldn't you take the values There's no such thing as k-fermi. I'm doing dimensional analysis. You don't know anything. No. The density of electrons isn't a fundamental state, uh, quantity of matter. It's a, it's a feature of a particular material. Now, it so happens that because the stability of matter is determined by the balance between the Coulomb and the 
uh, and the kinetic energies that the density of matter is on the order of 1 over the Bohr radius cubed. But this, this is totally distinct from saying I know anything about what I'm looking at. This is a quant so this is really very different conceptually from anything that people have talked about. Uh, we'll see KF occurring in other things, but those come from theories of the transport in a metal, where you have properties of the metal coming in and then you take some limit. This is really just straight dimensional analysis. I hand you Schrodinger's equation and you say, what will I construct out of the constants that occur in Schrodinger's equation? I, I mean, it's a, it's a, I think it's an important dichotomy. Um, yeah, there was a question back there. So two other scales that depend on the on fundamental uh, constant, like the electron classical radius and Compton radius, wouldn't they be considered as candidates? So, so um, unless I have the speed of light, which is, yeah. so I'm going to assume that everything is non-relativistic here. If I have the speed of light, then in fact this dimensional analysis becomes much more complicated because then I have a dimensionless parameter which is the fine structure constant and I could take my dimensionful quantities and multiply it by any factor of the fine structure constant that you want. Also, if I knew that there was both the mass of the electron and the mass of the proton, I would have another dimensionless ratio and I could multiply this by, so this does involve a statement about what I think the important physics is. It's non-relativistic and it's the physics of electrons. Okay, so let's ask, is there anything about this that tells us something about nature? So this is my ab initio theory of the resistivity of materials. If there is no protons, there is no materials, right? Um, just electrons. How they could resist if there is no matter? So, um, so the, the answer to your question is that what I've effectively done here is I've assumed that the speed of light is infinity and that the mass of the proton is likewise infinity. So it's not really that I've assumed the proton's not there, but that I've assumed that its mass is infinite in rel relation to the electron mass so that I don't have this additional dimensionless parameter. Okay? I haven't assumed anything about temperature, so we'll have to ask. But by the same analysis, I would estimate from dimensional analysis that the characteristic energy scales of solids is a Rydberg, because that's the only energy I can make with these same constants. And therefore, I would say I'm always at low temperature. So. Uh, my dimensional analysis would advise me to ignore the temperature entirely. Okay? It's, so here's, here's the resistivity of materials, metals, that don't have anything special. And by don't have anything special, I mean they don't happen to be really good crystals. So here's the resistivity of some horrible multi-component metallic glasses. Oh no. Sorry, this is some alloy, titanium and aluminum, as a function of temperature. Here's the resistivity of um, liquid mercury with potassium embedded in it. Uh, Here's the resistivity of some glass, in this case at low temperature, in this case at high temperature. Here's the resistivity of mercury at room temperature. I would claim that if these were the only things we'd measured resistivities of, that I have a pretty good theory of it. I mean, of course, I don't expect my dimensional analysis to give me the exact value for anything. But what you see is that the resistivity is 
you know, within a factor of two equal to this estimate that I've made on the basis of dimensional analysis. There are, there are 100,000 materials. Something that happened, I mean, why did you pick those three materials? They were what I could find, but if I want, I, I want to, what? Did you narrow your search to something which is around 136? No, I did not. What I looked for was materials that weren't good crystals. So I want to have either glasses or liquid metals or horribly disordered alloys. And I challenge you to find any material that satisfies that criterion that isn't going to have a resistivity that's within roughly a factor of two of what I've calculated. If, if you do, I think that's very interesting. Yeah. So I, I completely agree with you, but I think you just should add one important thing to this. These are materials which have one electron per atom. In that case, the distance between the atom and the Fermi wavelengths are of the same order of magnitude. Because you see, if you do take the root picture, how do you? Is that? I mean, formula, you decay, you do, this is if you take a metallic glass, yeah. but with one electron, very dilute. Then the resistivity can be much higher. Because now you are just assuming that there's one electron per atom. So the atomic distance, the Bohr radius, and the electronic characteristic length is the same. Well, no, they're, they're, they're more or less the same because of the stability of matter. But they're actually not that close. I mean, the typical distance between atoms is usually about two angstroms, which is four times a Bohr radius, which when I cube it, is a pretty big number. It's actually quite extraordinary, I think, that this works so well. But look, you know, I'm sure we can find special things that don't satisfy this. But I think that if you look, I've looked, you know, I've looked through liquid metals. I don't find ones that are very different. Yeah? I'll give you a counterexample. Phosphorus stop silicon. As you know, the metal insulator transition happens. Yeah, I understand. But phosphorus dope silicon is something very special. I want to take some amorphous system. And of course, there will be things like window glass, which has no particular structure and which violates this by a huge amount. Okay, And I'll talk about that in a minute. But there's a wide class of systems where I really, I haven't done what Danny accused me of. I just looked on the web to find what liquid crystals I could find, what metallic glasses I could find. And OK, I've, this isn't all of them, but they're all, comp, all the ones I could find were comparably close to the quantum of resistance. That may sort of answer my question, but it seems like I could take a lot of amorphous semiconductors that would be less conducting than this, and you would say, well, those aren't really metals. But then it seems like the definition of a metal is becoming something that has this conductivity. Right. So what I claim is the following, that from this perspective, there are three types of materials in nature. There are those of which there are quite a few that have a resistance that's comparable to the quantum of resistance. And in some sense, for these, we don't need a theory of resistivity because they have the natural resistivity. We don't need a theory of their resistivity any more than we need the, a theory for the density of materials, which we understand follows from dimensional analysis. Um, uh, OK, I don't have it here. Then there are two other types of materials that we encounter. There are materials that we call good metals which for some reason have resistivities that are much, much lower than this. And for this, we need a theory. And indeed, for crystalline metals, we do have a theory. It's Bloch's theorem. Bloch's theorem tells us that for this very special arrangement of atoms, there is an emergent length scale in the problem, the mean free path, which is very long compared to any uh, microscopic length, and that the presence of that long mean free path is the remarkable piece of physics of highly conducting metals. And then there are other materials which are basically insulators, materials where the resistance diverges as we go to zero temperature. And there again, there is something new happening that's causing the electrons to be localized. And that's again something that we have to study. So, this is really a way of parsing 
Is there some phenomenon in the metal that we want to understand that requires a qualitative understanding, or is it just what follows from dimensional analysis? Okay, so of course I know that there are lots of materials that violate this. Okay, those are in many ways the interesting things. But before we figure out what's interesting, we have to figure out what's uninteresting. Okay, now, people have approached finding a quantum of resistance in a different way. What they've done is to find bounds on the validity of various theoretical approaches. So, for instance, you do Druda theory, and you find some expression for the resistivity that involves the mean free path. And this is a very beautiful theory, but it's valid only when the quasi-particle picture on which it's based is sufficiently well uh, accurately defined. Uh, if you were to base it on Fermi liquid theory, you would like the quasi-particle lifetime to be long compared to the quasi-particle energy, which would require that the scattering rate be much smaller than the temperature, which would require that the resistivity should be much less than this quantity, which is the quantity that Addy was recommending that I look at, uh, in which I have the Fermi wavelength appearing rather than the Bohr radius. But for Fermi liquid theory to be valid, even this is not a good enough bound. This must be much less than T over EF times this. In order for Boltzmann theory to be valid, it's not necessary to have well-defined quasi-particles, but it is well necessary to have the scattering rate be small compared to the Fermi energy, which requires that the resistivity be less than this value. These are not really physical bounds on the resistivity. They are physical bounds on a particular theoretical opinion of what the physics is that leads to the resistivity. Uh, there's also the yofi regel limit, which is that the mean free path be much larger than the lattice constant. Um, again, you'll object that the lattice constant and the Fermi momentum are sort of similar to each other, and so maybe there's not really a distinction between this criterion and this criterion, but conceptually there is a difference, and even in some materials these can be different from each other. And this criterion really is the criterion for being able to ignore scattering between bands. I'm not actually sure why this is people's favorite limit. It seems to me it's probably not the relevant limit, but nonetheless it's a limit on some particular set of theoretical uh, ideas, and that would give a bound on the resistivity, something like this, where lambda is the bandwidth, and E Fermi is, of course, the Fermi energy. Okay, so these are all bounds. They have something interesting to tell us. They're telling us something more detailed than this more primitive estimate. This pr more primitive estimate is really only telling us that we think that the resistivity has something to do with quantum mechanics and electrons. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if I can get some water. Thanks. Um, well, for no particular reason, I've rewritten what these bounds mean in terms of length scales. The uh, Fermi liquid theory bound is that the mean free path is bigger than the thermal de Broglie wavelength. The Boltzmann theory bound is that the mean free path is longer than the Fermi wavelength. And we've already said this yofi regel bound is that the mean free path is much larger than the, uh, than the lattice constant. But I want to 
repeat that these are bounds on a theoretical approach. They don't necessarily tell us anything about how big or small the resistance can be. Indeed, a priori, we know that the resistance can be as big as it wants to be because we have insulators. Okay, so um, so what do I want to say next? Um, this is a little bit out of order, but uh, mm, thank you. That helps. <laughs> Um, so much of, much of what I'm going to talk about today is resistance that's in some funny intermediate regime, which, uh, which Boris Spivak calls semi-quantum, and maybe that's a good name for it. So uh, I'm going to look at the case in which the temperature is always much smaller than the Fermi energy, so quantum mechanics still plays an essential role in the dynamics of the electrons. But in many cases, the temperature will be higher than some or all of the phonon frequencies. So the phonons may well be classical. Um, and I'm going to consider systems in which the resistivity is at least comparable to this value h over e squared times the Fermi momentum. So although I don't know what the right theory is, I do know what the wrong theory is. There can't possibly be a theoretical description of this in terms of coherent propagation of quasiparticles. Uh, and yet, I want to look at systems which are metallic in the sense that the resistance is a increasing function of temperature. And see, the problem is that the only real understanding we have of why resistances tend to increase with temperature in metals is based on a quasiparticle picture that we have quasi-particles that could propagate freely at low temperature, and as we heat the system up, there's more and more stuff scattering them. But if we don't have this quasi-particle picture, we don't even understand why the resistance should be an increasing function of temperature. Um, uh, okay, so let me skip this. Um, good. So. Uh, there was an old understanding that, that at least made sense of this, which was the notion of resistivity saturation. So here's, here's this quantum of resistance that I, was, that I talked about at the beginning. This is 135 microohm centimeters, uh, again, made out of dimensional analysis. I didn't tell you anything about what material I was looking at. And here's the resistivity of the old-fashioned high-temperature superconductors, the A15s. And the A15s, I mean, I think there's still interesting physics to go back to about the A15s. But to zeroth order, I think the understanding was and still is that the reason the A15s were particularly good superconductors was that they were metals with particularly big electron phonon uh, couplings. And that both allowed them to become superconducting at a high temperature, but it also meant that when you do the usual Boltzmann transport theory, which works quite nicely at low temperatures, you very rapidly get to values of the resistance that are approaching <coughs> this quantum of resistance. And at that point, the quasi-particle picture breaks down. So if you just take the uh, uh, Bloch-Grunheisen expression for the resistivity for these fit to the low temperature data here, you get this red curve. And what you see is the red curve fits very nicely until the resistance starts to get comparable to the quantum of resistance, where you would expect the quasi-particle picture to break down. And in keeping with your expectation, 
something indeed goes wrong. And the something that goes wrong was described as resistivity saturation. Functionally, it fits very nicely to the following expression. Calculate the resistivity, ignoring the fact that you're getting into dangerous territory. Just take the bloch grunheisen expression for the resistivity, which in this range of temperatures, where you're at temperatures above the phonon frequencies, means that the resistivity is simply linear in temperature. So extrapolating that is easy. And then add it in parallel to some other resistance, which has a value that's on the order of the quantum of resistance. And this gives you an expression that moderately well fits this. There are some theoretical attempts to derive this, but there's actually no real theory of this. So this resistivity saturation is an old, unsolved problem. But at least one piece of this makes sense, which is that at low temperatures, the quasi-particle picture works. The conventional theory of metals is sensible. And then when the mean free path starts to approach the Fermi wavelength, as you might have expected, something goes badly wrong with the theory. And so that at least, that's, that's a good thing for theories to go wrong where they're supposed to go wrong. That gives you confidence that the theory maybe is right where it works. Um, resistivity saturation of some sort or other is seen in a variety of different materials. This is from a review article by Nigel Hussey. Uh, this is uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. It's the resistance in two different crystallographic directions. Uh, here again is my 135 microohm centimeters, not caring about what elements I'm looking at and so on. And I think you'll agree that at least this saturation value is sort of roughly determined by this quantum of resistance. Actually, to a remarkable extent, this, this, this a priori theory doesn't do so badly when everything else breaks down in many cases. Uh, this is uranium platinum 3, and this is cerium aluminum 3. Uh, here, the Resistivity saturation has somewhat more structure than it does in the A15s. The resistance overshoots its asymptotic high temperature value and then settles back down to some value that's close to the quantum of resistance. Yes? So the saturation uh, approaches the limit that has the bare mass. What? This uh, blue line yeah. has the bare mass in it. The mass, of the ba mass of the electron. I mean, I, yeah, I didn't, you know, I, I'm not fudging anything. This is just, you know, 135 microohm centimeters. Okay, you know, if you knew too much, if you knew anything about these materials, you would have put something much more sophisticated in there. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. So that's, that's, that was sort of nice. Uh, it's not that we understood resistivity saturation, but at least it convinced us that the theory of metals broke down in some way we didn't know how to predict, but it broke down where we predicted it should break down. Um, now, what was, became painfully obvious with the discovery of the cuprates, and now seems to be a rather ubiquitous feature of many, but not all highly correlated electron systems. Certainly the A15, the um, heavy fermion systems that I just showed you are also strongly correlated. But many strongly correlated resist, uh, materials have resistances that are metallic in the sense that the resistance continues to increase without any sign of saturation at high temperatures, but at magnitudes that rise well above this quantum of resistance. 
and where if you were to force this to be interpreted in terms of Boltzmann transport theory, it would mean mean free paths that are much smaller than the Fermi wave number. Yes? In those materials also, the, the Fermi wavelength is uh, comparable to the unit cell. So this would mean yes. the are smaller than the unit cell? Yes. I mean, um, I'll comment on one case which is even more ridiculous than that, but yes. They're, they're not, these are systems that have, as, uh, as Comren pointed out, on the order of one electron per unit cell. Maybe one, maybe four, but not 10 to the minus three. Yeah. Um, and in fact, often, the resistance is seen to be linear in temperature. <coughs> and by the way, something else that's not always stressed, but one of the other features of Boltzmann transport theory is uh, Matheson's rule, which says that whatever is giving rise to the resistivity, when you add some other scattering mechanism, that scattering mechanism tends to increase the resistivity. So whatever is causing the resistivity, if I heat the system up, say, past some optical phonon frequency, I would expect to see some increase in the resistivity as scattering by some new set of optical phonons on sets. And one thing that these bad metals do is they ignore the optical phonons. OK, so here's, here's some examples. So here's this data in niobium-3 tin that I showed you before. This is the A15s. If I were to show you copper on this plot, it's this black line down here at the bottom. You really, you just can't see it on this scale. These things are much more resistive than good metals. So here's niobium-3 tin, and here's optimally doped cuprate lanthanum strontium copper oxide. Here you can see its linear temperature dependence. This is from a slide by Dmitry Basov. People like to uh, play around with just what the bound is on Boltzmann transport theory, putting in factors of 2 pi uh, in order to try to make it seem that Boltzmann transport theory has a broader range. Uh, uh, here was my estimate of the quantum of resistance, but whichever, whichever version of this you use, this resistance clearly marches up to values that are much above this uh, Boltzmann transport limit. If I were to show you the resistance in the C direction, this is the resistance in the most conducting direction. If I show you for the same material resistance in the least conducting C direction, it's still linear in temperature, but it's two to three orders of magnitude larger than this. Uh, here's, here's a quasi one dimensional organic, super con uh, organic uh, charge density wave system, TTF, TCNQ, again with a nice linear temperature dependence of the resistance that doesn't seem to pay any attention at all to the quantum of resistance. This is a strontium ruthenate, but not that strontium ruthenate, and also not that other strontium ruthenate. This is the cubic infinite layer strontium ruthenate that has a ferromagnetic transition at around 150 Kelvin, below which it becomes a reasonably good metal, and above which it has this T linear resistance, which doesn't seem to saturate. I'm going to make a slight aside here. Um, uh, this term, bad metals, uh, was introduced, I think, by Vic Emery and me. And it was, I mean, we were, of course, struck by this, but we weren't the first people to be struck by this fact that there was no resistivity saturation here. Um, but we made another argument which upset people very much, and let me just make the argument, 
we said, all right, look, up here where the resistance is huge, nobody in the world would say that this can be explained by well-defined quasi-particles scattering off something. Now, down here near TC, if we're a little bit optimistic about two pi's, we have a resistance that's low enough that maybe we could describe this in terms of quasi-particles, and maybe we can use some of the usual machinery of theoretical phys physics. But we made the following argument, which isn't a slam dunk, but also isn't totally stupid. We said, if there are no quasi-particles up here, and if the resistivity is dead linear in temperature, without any sign of a crossover, then probably you better not use a quasi-particle description of the system, even here, just above TC. And that's very upsetting, because that means that you have to invent a totally new approach to the theory of superconductivity. Okay, so that's, that's the, the controversial thing that we said, and I'll come back to that on the basis of calculations that uh, Erez and Yokai have done. I'm actually less confident of, the, of how convincing that argument is. Um, ah, here's the example that I wanted to show you. This is this is rubidium 3C60, uh, organic superconductor with a nice high uh, superconducting transition temperature. But what I want you to see is that at high temperatures, it has a T linear resistivity. And notice this is one microohm centimeters, two microohm centimeters. My quantum of resistance here is now this blue line down at the bottom. So no matter how you play around with two pi's, um, there's just no way this value of the resistance can be understood in terms of Boltzmann transport theory. To give you an idea of how wedded people are to Boltzmann transport theory, this little cartoon is from this paper where they pointed out without the least bit of embarrassment that the mean free path that they extract from this is about one angstrom, whereas the single unit cell, that is to say the single C60 molecule is, I can't remember, seven or eight angstroms apart. So they have this nice cartoon of the electron scattering many times within a single molecule. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is the, this is the real strontium ruthenate. Uh, this is data from Andy McKenzie. And again, you see this uh, failure to saturate. Here, at low temperature, this system becomes a nice Fermi liquid. There's no problem with this low temperature behavior. There's some sort of crossover that occurs as you cross this line, and the temperature dependence crosses over from T squared to T. So it tells you that it's doing something new. So that's, of course, good. Uh, but this, again, is not explicable by Boltzmann transport theory. Uh, here's resistivity curves from um, Ian Fisher on various doping levels of one of the iron-based superconductors. It's doing all sorts of interesting things. It's resistance in two different directions, showing nice evidence of pneumatic fluctuations. But here, at elevated temperatures, you see this familiar, more or less t-linear temperature dependence of the resistance at values that are much bigger than the quantum of resistance. OK, so uh, I've told you uh, why conventional theory doesn't work. Um, lots of people have tried to offer theories that do work. Um, um, one idea is that you can use quantum criticality as an organizing principle. Um, you know, that's a nice idea because it gives you a handle on it. It has a lot of problems. First place, this behavior extends up to rather high temperatures. That's, I think, asking a lot of a poor quantum critical point to control the physics up to, say, 1500 Kelvin. And also, it seems like quite an accident 
that so many uh, highly correlated materials just happen to be in a broad quantum critical regime. Um, maybe it's uh, somehow some intrinsically non-Fermi liquid incoherent fluid of the sort suggested by uh, the ADS-CFT correspondence. Uh, I wrote a review paper with some group of people a while ago on the coup rates. And uh, uh, well, I think we were grasping at straws. We said at the least, however, holography can supply powerful metaphors teaching physicists to think differently, leading to new questions to ask in experiments. So the new question is, could you imagine some well-defined but totally incoherent fluid that describes the high temperature phase uh, regime of highly correlated electron systems? I think, you know, if I knew how to do that, I think that would be a very appealing solution to the problem. Whoop, now what did I do? Um, a number of people have had the idea that maybe you could prove some fundamental bound which restricts some aspect of transport and then maybe you wouldn't have to understand in detail what was going on but you would just understand that some set of systems are as resistive as they can be with some fine print, because we know that there are insulating systems that can be much more uh, resistive, and that the behavior you're seeing just reflects saturation of some bound, maybe on the rate of equilibration. I think that's a very appealing idea. Um, for the purpose of this conference, there's the idea that maybe, since we can't think about quasi-particles here, that we should think about this as being some emergent hydrodynamic regime. So let me just spend a minute or two on this idea. So why might hydrodynamics come to the rescue here? Well, first place, these bad metals are seen in good crystals. That is to say, people have spent an awful lot of time and effort making the best possible crystals they can these are very good crystals by most metrics of solid state physics. They're very pure. They have very sharp coherence peaks. And moreover, um, this bad metal behavior seems to be fairly insensitive to sample quality. So you take the best crystal that anybody's made and you take some crystal that somebody made in their garage with a Mr. Superconductivity kit and their resistivity in this t-linear regime are pretty similar to each other. So maybe that gives you an excuse to say that maybe we can extrapolate to the zero disorder limit that disorder is having a negligible effect there. And so one of the enemies of hydrodynamics, maybe we can discount. Um, and then all of these bad metals are strongly correlated. And so, as we've all been saying, in order to get into the hydrodynamic regime, you have to be looking at distance scales that are large compared to some electron-electron scattering rate. And the fact that these are strongly correlated makes you think that maybe this rate is small, and so that the hydrodynamic regime onsets at some very short distance scale. Uh, and then maybe we can express things in terms of a viscosity rather than a resistivity, and then maybe there's no significance to the quantum of resistance. I, I should be thinking in terms of viscosities and geometric barriers and other things. So that's the good news. There are a lot of phonons in these materials. These materials, although they have maybe one or two or three electrons per unit cell, tend to have 10 or 15 or 20 atoms per unit cell, which means three times that number of phonon modes per unit cell. So there really are a lot of phonons here. Um, and moreover, despite the fact that 
the optical phonons don't show up in the resistivity. There's all sorts of other evidence that the electron phonon coupling in these systems is very small. In fact, Mueller looked at the cuprates precisely because he thought there would be a very strong Jan Teller coupling to the phonons, and he thought that would be good for superconductivity. The perovskites are well known for their strong electron phonon couplings. There's all sorts of evidence of charge ordering that has major effects on the phonon modes. As you dope the system, distances to apical oxygens change by really large amounts. There are really strong electron phonon couplings here. Now, maybe, maybe we can get out of phonons by going into some sort of phonon drag regime, but with so many phonons with such complex dispersions, that's hard for me to imagine. Uh, I was asked about the size of the Fermi surface. The sizes of the Fermi surface are large, so there's no reason to think that electron umklop scattering will be a weak effect. And certainly in these temperatures, we're exciting phonons over the whole Briouin zone, so phonon umklop processes will certainly be strong. So let me try one more argument that maybe the um, hydrodynamics isn't quite so stupid. So what you would really like to do is to see some direct evidence that the electron spectral function relaxes rapidly compared to the current. So, okay, we do photo emission on these things. Now, most of the photo, photo emission is done either in the superconducting state or in the pseudo-gap state. And the photo emission spectra are extremely complicated in those states, and so people fight about what they mean. But in single-layer BISCO, it turns out that the pseudo-gap temperature is rather low, and so it's possible to get into the pseudo-gap regime above T star, in this case at 172 Kelvin, the pseudo-gap temperature is about 150 Kelvin, and to measure the electron spectral functions. And the electron spectral functions look quite simple. Here's the electron spectral functions. Here we're seeing uh, intensity as a function of binding energy for different cuts through the Fermi surface. And so you see some peak. It disperses up to the Fermi energy. It's got some fairly simple shape. It's got a peak and a width. And so, uh, you know, that looks a little familiar. But now let's zoom in on this here. Let's just take one of these. And what you see is the scale here is 0.2 eV. So here we're at 172 Kelvin. And I don't know, by eyeball, the width of this peak, I said the half width is something like 0.05 eV, so uh, something like 500 Kelvin or something. So the widths of these peaks are broad compared to the temperature, whereas we're in a regime where the resistivity is linear in temperature, so some current scattering rate is maybe a few times smaller than this quasi-particle scattering rate. This, I'm a co-author on this paper, and this is the paper of mine that has the most authors. I, I almost am like a high-energy physicist there. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the most coherent quasi-particle in the cuprate, so here's a famous paper by Peter Johnson on optimally doped bilayer BISCO, which has a much higher TC, and this is looking at the width in K space of the quasi-particle propagating along the diagonal direction. And here he's plotted the width of that peak for several different samples um, as a function of temperature and compared it to the resistivity. And actually, if you take the Fermi velocity measured here and use it to compare to the scattering rate that you would get interpreting this in terms of Boltzmann transport theory, these widths, quasi-particle widths, and the transport 
temperature dependence look more or less the same. So I don't know what that means, but that's certainly <coughs> discouraging for hydrodynamics. All right, so that's, um, so I started a little late. When do you want me to stop? That's, that's all I have to say really on this subject. Uh, do you want to take uh, five minutes? Uh, okay, so let me, let me take five minutes to advertise some work that uh, Yochai and Erez did that I think give some, uh, on this one I was what I would call myself a kibitzing co-author. Um, yes? Yeah. Uh, about these bad metals and breaking the upper regular limit. So maybe one more recipe that the electron can find is, I mean, the resistivity involves momentum transfer, not necessarily the absolute momentum. And there are higher Brillen zones that uh, can be part of the story, not just the first Brillen zone. So can it be that uh, it breaks this lattice constant uh, limit just by involving higher momentum transfer? Sure, but that's not what I'm worried about. I mean, I think this lattice constant is a red herring. What I'm worried about is that it gives a scattering rate that's smaller than the Fermi wavelength, which means you can't define any sort of wave packet at all. Okay, so if it was, if it was just the lattice constant, I wouldn't be quite so worried about it. Did I get it correctly when you showed these two artists data? The point was that the messages are very different, no? Uh, this is, in this case, the, the, ca the Kazakh particle which is too broad to make any sense to trust, you know, to talk about it. Well, this it's also too broad. Here, the width of the quasi-particle is the temperature, or twice the temperature. So this is marginally too, if this is marginally bad, and this is just bad, bad. <laughs> but can I, since the slope, the resistivity slope in both cases are similar. So if I understand your, your reason, you are saying that the resistivity is the same, but in one case where the material is very dirty, RFS is a much broader peak, and this is the way people were reasoning that there should be a scattering. <coughs> what you are saying is that actually scattering time has no meaning. In this case. Probably. Um, this one does have also a moderately large residual resistance. So there is some reason to think that this particular material is also highly disordered. Um, but then again, um, then again, uh, this material, when you look at it by SDM, is an inhomogeneous nightmare. So, uh, and yet it has you know, at least relatively small residual resistivity. So uh, I don't know quite what to say about that either. What disorder doesn't do any of the things you would really expect it to do in these problems. So, you know, we invoke disorder anytime we want to get out of a problem, but that's just because we understand so little about the effect of disorder in these systems. Yeah? If you try to look at the classical effects that involve K-Fermi, Geometrical, geometrical resonances in a magnetic field, so, or, or Aspel-Kamer. You mean quantum, quantum oscillations? Not quantum, classical. So, so just seeing cyclotron. Magneto uh, 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 angle resolve, what are they called? AMRO, you mean? I, I don't know what that is, but geometric yeah. resonances of, uh, of uh, cyclotron motion with, yeah. the, with the phonons or with the uh, yeah. uh, periodic uh, uh, potential. Is, is, so something that measures KF but is classical, is, is, is there something that's seen? I, mean, I don't quite know what you, I mean, photo emission measures KF very nicely. Uh, there, I don't think there's any question about what KF is. No, no, but the question is, do you see, can you think about quasi-particles taking, you know, cycloton orbits? Um, okay. Does it make sense to think about a, a quasi-particle completing a, a, a yeah. whole evolution. I mean, so look, you have to understand there's a lot of technical problems here. So first place, these are high temperature superconductors. So they're superconductors 
until you get to quite high temperature. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to these high temperatures, for sure you're not going to see anything coherent. Nobody would expect to see anything coherent. You don't, but that's not a surprise. That doesn't, you know, even with if there was quasi-particles, they would be too incoherent on too short of length scales to give you anything. Um, now, when you quench superconductivity with super high fields, one of the recent very exciting discoveries is you actually do see absolutely standard uh, lifshitz kosovich quantum oscillations. I mean, you, there's no question that at low temperature, you, with superconductivity quenched, you have absolutely standard Landau quasi-particles. The Fermi surface has nothing to do with the Fermi surface that's inferred from ARPIS or from band structure. It's tiny little pockets. It's only seen in the cleanest of materials. Well, that's sort of oxymoronic because that's the definition of the cleanest materials. But um, uh, it's only seen in some small subset of materials over some small range of doping. But where these experiments are possible, we do know that really at low enough temperatures, there really are Landau quasi-particles in these systems. That, that's been a, a big revolution in, in this field in the last, uh, uh, I don't know, half decade or whatever it is. Is there a specific heat data for these materials? Um, yes. Now, is there specific heat data that you can count on? Well, you know, the problem is these are high temperature superconductors. So most of what we're talking about is high temperatures where the phonon specific heat is 99% of the specific heat. So what you have to do if you want to ask about what's going on with the electronic specific heat is you have to have some prescription for subtracting <laughs> off most of the specific heat. So people have done this. They've done a serious job of this in various ways. But it's not obvious, at least to me, that the data is trustworthy. OK, with that being said, if you trust it, if you look in the normal state, you see a T linear uh, specific heat with a magnitude that's more or less what you would expect based on the dispersions from ARPUS. And then this specific heat gets depressed by a factor of two or three as you go into the pseudo gap regime. OK, I'm not sure what we conclude from that, but that's what the measurements of the specific heat say. If you want to look at specific heat that we really trust, you quench superconductivity and well, you go to low temperature. If you go to low temperature in the superconducting state, you see a residual T linear uh, specific heat. Um, you, that's inconsistent with a clean D wave superconductor. So you might say that that's due to disorder. However, this T linear specific component of the specific heat is largest in the cleanest materials and smallest in the most disordered materials. So that's also something of a puzzle. Um. And then if you go to high magnetic fields and low temperatures, you see, um, you see a specific heat <coughs> that's T linear and that more or less corresponds to the density of states that you infer from the quantum oscillations which is also a puzzle because you might think there would be other states around as well. Yes? What? You know, everything this, that you can think of has been measured. I mean, like the quantum oscillations, they've seen the quantum oscillations in every letter of the alphabet. Um, I don't know. What do you want to know? It, become, it changes sign. What? It does all sorts of different things in different ranges of the phase diagram. Um, does it have the right units? What? Does it have the right units? It has the right units. <laughs> <laughs> but it changes sign. It becomes negative at low temperatures in some regions of the phase diagram. OK. Um, so maybe I should stop. Uh, let me just say there's some nice calculations by these guys of the electron phonon problem 
in some weird solvable large n limit where you can solve it. And in this weird solvable large n limit, you can actually get into a regime where Boltzmann transport theory breaks down and where the resistivity, depending on the nature of the electron phonon coupling, is either T linear and non saturating or saturating. So it's a nice proof of principle that such things can occur. It carries with it some other baggage, which is a little bit less fortunate, but I think that this may be some sort of a right step in the right direction. Or it's a, certainly a step. I think it might be in the right direction. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so I'm trying to think about the dimensional, uh, dimensional argument. Uh, what happens to a normal metal that has this uh, kind of fancy micro ohms? Yeah, so, so that's what I was trying to say. So, so if you take copper, it never gets anywhere near this value before it melts. Yeah, let, let me finish the question. Yeah. So, so what, what happens to it when it reaches melting temperature? Right? Mm -hmm. When it melts and becomes a liquid, does resistivity stay, stay the same? Yeah, no, so my understand, okay, so I have not done an exhaustive search, <laughs> but my understanding is that the resistivity of liquid metals are all around 135 microm centimeters. Good. So now, now the real question is what happens to the bed metal when it melts? Does resistivity drop? I don't know. I think it burns. <laughs> At least that's what happens to TTF, TC, and QWERT, fries. <laughs> but I don't know. But, I mean, it would be, would be spectacular to see resistivity dropping on it. Yeah, yeah. I, I w so that's my prediction. OK, that's a good idea. I predict that if you melt uh, YBCO, the resistance will drop to the quantum of resistance. So, uh, something a little bit less dramatic, but you showed the heavy Fermi element of your shoots. Mm -hmm. Goes down afterwards. Yeah. So I, I have a question. Uh, you, you mentioned about this boundary, the idea that you present a different ways of circumventing this. But then there is also an experimental observation by Andy McKenzie about relaxation time. You see, I put it in this way. As you said, if you compare cuprates and copper, cuprates have a resistivity which is several hundreds of micron centimeter copper at room temperature is 1.6 micron centimeter. Mm -hmm. If you translate it to a length scale, in one case you are well below you know, uh, anywhere that causes a problem for the boundary, but for YBC, uh, it is, of course, you need another thing. Now, if you talk about relaxation time, electrons in YBC and electrons in copper are both scattered at room temperature of the order of magnitude, which is this famous function. Right. So do you think that it's just an accident, or does it say something profound? So, so I don't know, but the point, I mean, I wish I knew. It's, an in, it's a certainly an extremely interesting observation. The, the interpretation of these times is very different. In copper, when you have a time that's kT at room temperature, that or 2 pi kT or whatever it is, that's tiny compared to EF. So you're deeply in the regime where Boltzmann transport theory uh, is internally consistent. And in the coup rates, it's comparable to EF. So you're at the edge of the region where Boltzmann transport theory should be breaking down. I should say one of the things that's a little bit unsettling here in this solution, which, which relates to what you said, the way, the way this manages to get a T linear resistivity above the quantum of resistance is it has a scattering rate. OK, that's maybe bad terms, but a width of the Druda peak that grows like square root of T. So it strongly deviates from T linear. And it has an F sum rule weight that drops like 1 over the square root of t. And those two square roots of t combine to give a t linear resistivity. But it's for a reason that looks totally different than 
Boltzmann transport, which would give us a temperature independent F sum rule and a width that goes linearly with T. So, you know, that, and while maybe something like that is going on in strongly some strongly correlated materials, in the cuprates, whatever deviations there are of the F sum rule in plane are apparently rather small. I mean, if we have a moment, when you said you were going to advertise significant recent work by Erez, I thought that you were going to talk about a different paper, which I think is a really significant paper by Erez and Connie uh, uh, and John Hartnell, which uh, uh, refers back to the question that, that, that uh, Cameron was just asking. And that shows you a way of translating any time you're getting this magic scattering rate into a problem where you have a degenerate <coughs> carrier scattering from a non-degenerate one. And, uh, and, and that's not going to work really for the bad metal problem. So it's not uh, talking about your problem, but it is talking about the quasi-universality of the T-linear scattering rate in many systems. I, I agree with your statement. OK, so let's uh, thank Steve again.